Hello and welcome to the Week 14 Edge Sports NFL Podcast. Today we will be recapping Week 14's NFL action. And I am your host, as always, Ian O'Connor, Senior Data Analyst here at Edge Sports. And as always, joining me is Scott Brown, our VP of Data Science. Scott, how was your weekend? Yeah, it was good. Took in the games. Uh, I think we can finally say that we're in the home stretch of the season, final month here after Week 14. And, um, you know, uh, got to watch my Bears on Sunday night. Got to or had to? Yeah, had to, I guess is right. You know, it's like one of, another one of those games where it seemingly everything goes right for the Bears and they still lose by 15, but, you know, um, is what it is. Come to expect it. Aaron Rodgers still owns the Bears fans. So, yeah, uh, I'm just resigned to my fate. But, yeah, other than that, all in all, it was a good weekend. How was your weekend, Ian? It was good. It was good. Really, not a whole lot of good action as far as – the NFL goes a lot of you know blowouts. blowouts you mentioned yeah. coming into the the witching hour on red zone in the early slate of games. I think there was only one single possession game or single uh, single score game, so not a lot there. It's a little surprising to me that I don't believe any team still has clinched a playoff berth. Um, I know the the Packers and Buccaneers both had a chance to needed the Saints to lose as part of part of their clinching scenarios. The Saints obviously won against the Jets. Um, the Cardinals can clinch, I believe, with a win tonight. Though that's all they need, just a win. And they're in, um, at least for the playoffs. And they've got a pretty good lead atop the NFC West. So a lot still to happen. Yeah, uh, a lot, yeah. A lot of crazy things could happen. You're saying the technically looking at like Washington, the seven seed, could catch the Bucks If the Bucks lose out and Washington wins out, uh, Washington has the tiebreaker, but the Bucks have two games with the Panthers and a game with the Jets, so I don't see that happening. <laughs> yeah, it's a very flat year. Um, you know, a lot of parity. The records are all pretty close together, and yeah, it's really now that you have you know seven playoff spots, you really have things bunched up in, in on both sides where there's a lot of teams in it. So, if that was an intended uh, intended effect of the rule change, uh, I guess good for the NFL rule makers that be um but yeah it's it's i think as we head into this home stretch of the season it, it'll be interesting to see how things play out and who's able to secure a spot here in the coming weeks and, and who's ultimately left out yep. and before we get into the weekend's action we did have a couple good games so we'll cover those first just want to let you know that we are available on the edge sports podcast network on your podcast platform of choice as well as the Edge Sports YouTube channel where you can catch these podcasts, our coach rankings videos, all of our pregame matchup videos with betting insights for every game. So please subscribe to any of those, any or all of those shows uh, on any of those platforms. Please give us a five-star review just to help us grow our audience to get even more listeners here. And then don't forget that our coach rankings update will come out on Wednesday. We have those updated every single Wednesday. We will have a, a video again this week with our brand ambassador of Champion Gaming, Katie George, will be with us. And that, again, that will go out on Wednesday afternoon. Now that we've gotten all of that out of the way, we'll get into those overtime thrillers we had. Now, I mentioned the early window really wasn't too exciting. The late window really wasn't for much of the, much of the period until we had a couple big comebacks to force overtime. The first uh, was Bills. The first one we'll cover is the Bills and the Buccaneers. The Bills were down big, 24-10 to 10 to start the fourth quarter. They were down 24-3 to 3 at one point. Came all the way back to tie it at 27 and forced overtime against Brady and the Bucks. But Tom Brady would not be bested this week. He had our third most impactful play of the weekend, and it was the game winner. Only 542 left in overtime, just coming up on the halfway mark. Buffalo had gotten the ball first, punted on fourth and four from their own 31, kind of an in-betweener decision. Um, nonetheless, Tampa Bay got the ball back. They had third and three on their own 42. So the Bills looking to get a big stop. Tom Brady completes a pass to uh, newly recently returned Brashad Perriman. I think he was last there when Jameis was there a couple years ago. Catches it coming across the middle. Uh, looked, I think it was from left to right and takes it 58 yards for the touchdown. That was a 36% increase in win probability. Obviously took them up to 100% because it won right. the game. Um, so just a really exciting finish to that one. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that Bucks offense, so good. Of course, the defenses in this matchup, both also very good. Um, but they could not slow down their their counterpart, you know, their counterparts. Uh, just, you know, 60 points put up in this one, uh, even though it had to go to overtime. Yeah, I mean, guarding that, uh, guarding that Tampa Bay offense is just, I don't know how you do it. They have so many weapons, you know, even with AB out, somebody like Rashad Perriman steps up and makes a big play in a big moment. But, yeah, it's, you know... Uh, Credit to the Bills for getting back into it. You know, I think their their team definitely executed well in that second half, especially that fourth quarter, to, to make it competitive. But, you know, there just were a few kind of questionable decisions by their head coach in this one that uh, had us scratching our heads. And I think actually, you know, 
could have given themselves a better chance to win um, in maybe even without, you know, requiring overtime. So we'll, we'll get into that. That's right. And Sean McDermott came into this game fifth in our overall coach rankings. Uh, Bruce Arians not doing as well. Um, he is 14th overall, um, but only 29th in CCI, which is our fourth down decision-making metric, whereas McDermott was 15th. So middle of the pack, whereas Arians is at the end, this was actually one of our – Uh, coaching matchups to look forward to on the coach rankings that Katie and I had the video we did last week and we thought if this one came down to it and came down to a big call late it was going to be McDermott that made the right call because Arians is typically does not go for it a ton Um, turned out Arians didn't really have a big call to make Sean McDermott had a couple of them and made the wrong decision a couple times he starting off uh, early in the game uh, about five minutes into the second quarter trailing 10 to nothing chose to kick a field goal and fourth and goal from the three make it a, a, a seven-point game still you know, early on, but that was a 2.2% error in pre-snap win probability. None of these we'll cover did make our top five, um, but still, they kind of they add up over time. And, and later in the game, in the third quarter, they were down 21 points. Went called a fake punt on fourth and two from his own 45. We agree with the decision to go for it. And while you know we always say there is something to the element of surprise, the Bucks were not fooled. And when you've got a quarterback like Josh Allen, You know, it just makes sense to keep him on the field. The offense for Buffalo hasn't been great this year like they were last year. But when you've got Josh Allen, you've got Stephon Diggs, Dawson Knox, Cole Beasley, you've got a lot of playmakers on that team. I would rather trust my my offense with Josh Allen. Put the ball in his hands. Like Brandon Staley has mentioned, you know, we want to keep the ball in Herbert's hands, our best player. Totally agree. I think, um, you know, to, to play devil's advocate, maybe the one thing you could argue is that Bucks defense is really yep. good and maybe take some of those guys off the field and take your chances with a, you know, a, a special teams trick play. But, yeah, that one that one was, um, I think, one you know, a bone to pick that we have. Um, although, like you said, we, we overall like, you know, like going for it in that situation, kind of, um, you know, maybe independent of, of, of how they choose to do it. That one earlier on in the game that you just touched on, though, also one that we really don't like. I mean – you're playing against the Bucs. I know the defenses are good in this matchup. The offenses are really good, too, as we saw. Uh, you're already down p- 10 points early in the game. You're on your opponent's three-yard line, um, you know, in a, in a goal line situation. Go for it, man. I mean, like, you, you just you need the points. You're already down 10. You need the points. And, um, you know, you're, you're not going to – you really can't expect to field goal them to death in this yep. one. Um, and so, yeah, we really don't like that one. And then, um, you know, there was another one later on in the game uh, – well, I guess, yeah, you, you can touch on that one next. Yeah, the fourth fourth and th- very similar situation. So they were able to, to stop Tampa and get a touchdown to cut it to 24-10. But fourth and three on his own 45-yard line yet again chose to punt this time. Didn't even run a fake punt, just willingly gave the ball back to the Buccaneers. It was a 1.4% error in pre-snap win probability. So, again, not a huge number, but they were already so low. They were below 10%, I think, at this point to win. That led to another Tampa Bay field goal that made it a three-score game. Like, we know Tampa or Buffalo is able to come back and tie it, but you're nearing midfield. You're getting late in the game. I mean, you've just you've got to go for that. Exactly, and I mean, so you know they pulled a heroic comeback in that fourth quarter. But just imagine if uh, they had that same level level of execution, but instead of being down, you know, 17 yeah. points, they were, you know, maybe within two possessions or something like that. You know, this could have been a win without requiring overtime. And you're gonna call a fake punt on fourth and two, and then later in the game with time winding down. Like I said, pretty much the same scenario. It was a fourth and three instead of a fourth and two, but again, you're on your own 45, and you can't, you won't go for it again. I don't know because the fake punt didn't work. You thought, oh, we're not going to get it, you know, with the offense or just wanting to, to trust his defense, which ended up working out um, for the most part. Again, they gave up the field goal to make it a 17 point deficit, but just some some little errors that added up for Sean McDermott, who's been again number five overall, middle of the pack in fourth down decision making. So not necessarily great. Um, but still would expect a little bit better from him with the team that, with the team that he's got. And then we had a similar situation in 49ers Bengals. This one also back and forth. Bengals were down most of the game. Uh, had a rough go offensively. They're tra- heading into the fourth quarter down 20 to 6. They had a number of special teams blunders, a couple muffed punts, one of which they lost. They had a muffed kickoff that fortunately recovered, had some drops in this one. But the LSU connection between Joe Burrow and Jamar Chase was there again. Got him within one score at 20-13. to 13. And then with a few minutes left, Kyle Shanahan, who's eighth overall in our head sport, edge sports head coach rankings, made a, a pretty big mistake. Now, he's only 17th in CCI. Again, that's the fourth down decision-making metric, which is uh, half of the equation in our coach rankings. 
But he comes out with our second worst play call of the week. 247 left in the game. I said they're up seven. Fourth and two on their own 37. Chooses to punt, costing them 5.2% in pre-snap win probability. Again, number two worst fourth down decision of the week. They could have, you know, kept the ball. George Kittle dominated this game, had I think like 15 catches, a touchdown, 150 something yards, just seemed like was catching everything. Made a huge catch at the end of the game that set up the game winner in overtime. Um you guys like that, that offense that loves to run the ball, that runs the ball pretty well. Just so many playmakers on there. Again, Debo Samuel was back. Brandon Ayuk is there. And just on a fourth and two, you know, I understand his kind of thinking, I guess. We'll see this again um, with the Dallas game uh, when we get into our errors. You're up seven with 247 left. If you don't get it, at worst, I guess at worst, Cincinnati scores, goes for two, wins the game if there's no time left. That's asking a lot. You know, not only to get the touchdown, but to go for two. So next, you know, worst case scenario is they tie the game. You probably still have time because they don't have to go that far. You've still got your timeouts left. Um, this is just kind of a, a, a question, not one that you would see a lot of coaches go for, right. but one that I think, you know, Shanahan, he should have. And he is, I mentioned, kind of middle of the pack in decision making. But it seems like he's made a lot of questionable decisions here in the last few weeks. That's right. I think uh... – yeah, we're, we're, I think this is definitely an area where we depart from conventional thinking, even I think within the analytics community, but mm-hmm. definitely with NFL head coaches. We love going for it here on fourth and two, even from your own 37. Um, I think you take your chances with that, you know, that, you know, above average, pretty solid 49er offense against the Bengals D, um, you know, and uh, there's this nice benefit. We've talked about this many times where you know, setting yourself up to win even when things go wrong on the play, right? Mm-hmm. And so you, you pick up the first down here and the game's pretty much on ice. Uh, you only need to pick up two yards. So it's, you know, something that should be very, you know, converted at a very high rate. However, even if you fail, it's not the end of the world. Your defense get If your defense gets a stop, right, which is something they're going to have to do anyway if you punt, uh, if your defense gets a stop, you know, turnover on downs, you win. Um, and if they fail, right, they're going to fail more likely in a scenario where there's still time left on the clock, you know, or, and or you still have timeouts and you have, you know, a meaningful chance to rebuttal your opponent, right? Uh, you know, maybe you have a minute left or 30 seconds left in a timeout, something like that to go down the field, only needing a field goal to win it. So there's just more, more, um, you know, branches in the game tree to get nerdy for a second that are good for you, even when you fail, than if you just, you know, punt it away here. So, so we really like, um, you know, the aggressive play call, even though Kyle Shanahan was unable to find it. And uh, yeah, this one turns out to be our second worst error of the week. And you mentioned, you know, we kind of diverge a little bit, maybe even within the analytics community. Can you kind of speak on maybe what it is that makes some people say that we're, you know, a little bit too aggressive? That is there something within our model obviously it's been fine-tuned pretty much every year for the last what 20 years or more since it's been created that kind of makes it that way I know it, it seems like conversion rates are typically much higher than the average fan realizes maybe even the average coach um, but you said there are times that you know people say you know that's way too aggressive and we'll kind of get to a couple later on but is there anything that you can kind of say to ex- explain that maybe in a way yeah the thing I would point to most is like the clock gets really weird at the end of the game right um this happens in a lot of sports. Basketball is like a really good example mm-hmm. where like the strategy in the game just goes haywire at the end, right? Where teams are basically fouling, right? To sort yeah. of extend the game. In football, uh, and then also like another good example from basketball is like the two for one idea, right? Mm-hmm. Which we've, we've alluded to before. Yep. Um, and so one thing that I think our model is particu- particularly well suited for is to sort of account for that factor, right? The, the clock and how how it changes at the end of the game. We've, we've done extensive research and study on how teams are able to, to you know, change their behavior, you know, move more quickly down the field, take advantage of certain uh, facets of the game uh, and rules of the game, like you know, if you go out of bounds in the final two minutes or the final five minutes of the fourth quarter, really, um, you're able to stop the clock, right? Accounting for the two-minute warning, uh, the strategy, you know, from the defensive perspective, and stopping the clock, right, to to before the two-minute warning to sort of you know maximize the amount of clock stoppages, right, when you're when that defense is trailing, all of these things are are, are things we're able to account for that are that are you know they're problems. They're they're hard to they're hard to account for, and and they can be very hard for different approaches, different models to to really factor in accurately, right? So if you just have, I think like a simple win probability model. 
that that takes a look at the at the situation and spits out a number you know that that's it, it's it's going to be hard for that model to understand how the game is changing at the end right whereas with a simulation model and all of these individual components that are that are very much kind of crafted toward uh for these situations these specific situations at the end of the game we can we can actually simulate through kind of the sequence i think in a way that's more accurate and more realistic to how the game's actually played than than other approaches so yeah, that clock that clock thing I think is th- is something that's not I think is generally understood in an obvious way when things are really bad, but the more subtle things are harder to pick up on, and you know I think that's that's where our approach is really able to shine through, and and this is I think a, a great example of that. So yeah, so our I guess it sounds like our model almost assumes that the clock is going to stop more often in the final four, three, two minutes of the game than throughout the rest of the game because te- the way teams play, where they run those plays where they can get out of bounds. Um, so whereas other models maybe don't account for that as well, ours is, is very well suited to accounting for the, the clock stopping more often and teams basically maximizing the clock. Unless, you know, for some coaches that's not true, but like we saw with McVeigh a couple weeks ago, but, that, but for most people. Yeah, that's exactly right. Looking at, at the clock and, and how the clock runs off on plays at the end of the game when a team is trailing, you could look at, you know, one thing you, you might want to do is like look at the average amount of time that runs off the clock in those situations. And that would be a very horrible thing to just assume, right. you know, uh, that the, as far as how the game is actually played, right? Because mm-hmm. the distribution is very weird. It's, it's, it's bimodal is, is the term that we use in, in statistics uh, land. And it's, it's just very, like, oddly shapen. And it's in sort of like the... Uh, the speed and pace at which teams play depends greatly on like the state of the game and, mm-hmm. and, and the situation. So, you know, we, we've definitely studied this extensively and, and I feel like we have a pretty good handle on it. Um, and so making sure that you're able to account for how teams adapt when they're in those situations is very important. And um, yeah, basically what we find is that there's just a whole bunch of value to having the ball at the end of the game, right? You're able to, you know, by looking at the rest of the game, you don't really have a good sen- as good of sense as how quickly teams can move, especially with you know good mm-hmm. passing offenses, with even just like thirty seconds left or forty seconds left on the clock. So you know we find ourselves time and time again talking about how you know late game field goals that either you know give a, a team a one point lead or, or tie the game, if they leave forty seconds left on the clock, it's really not as good as you think it is, right? right? Like I think most folks sort of leap to okay, well we've won the game or okay we've secured overtime. No, not so fast. Um, you know, your opponent still has time to work, and they can really move the ball quickly down the field, um, and even more so when, you know, you have a competent quarterback and, and on passing offense. Yeah, I mean, kind of that reminds me of the game early in the season. I don't know. If, I remember because I'm a Packers fan. I don't know about everyone else out there. Maybe a 49ers fan will, but when Green Bay yeah, I remember that got too. the ball yeah. with 37 seconds left, I think no timeouts. Aaron Rodgers knew, okay, they're going to give us the middle of the field. As long as everyone's on the same page, hey, let's get down the field, spike. I think they got two completions, two spikes, and set up the game winner. That was so incredible. When yeah. you've just got a, a team, not only a quarterback and a passing offense that's that good, but that everyone kind of is on the same page and understands what's going on. You know, you practice those drills for a reason. Uh, you know, all week to make sure that you're able in that situation to maximize your time. And and when it comes down to it, you know, it doesn't often come down to it, but when it does. You know what to do, and you you've got it. Yeah, got it down. Yeah, that's a great example of uh, of what we're talking about for sure. So that now it was a very good explanation. Um, kind of hopefully that helps helps you all out there that are listening understand why some of these calls may seem a little on the aggressive side and may seem crazy. They are ca- sometimes counterintuitive, but that's the reason. You know that that time and the way Cincinnati was playing too, they were doing really well and they were able to get down the field. You know they San Francisco punted here, but Burrow hits Chase another time to tie the game up at 20. So Cincinnati was moving very well at that time. The San Francisco did get the ball back with a chance to win the game before overtime. Robbie Gold missed a 47-yard field goal. I think they mentioned his longest of the year was only like 51 or 52. Um, or it might have been 55, but he only made like two from 51. So not the Robbie Gold, I think, of the past that we're used to. Has had some injuries, um, just has been around for a long time. And this one just kind of kept pushing and pushing and pushing and, and ended up you know, going on the outside of the uprights, forced overtime. But then Zach Taylor, who's 18th in our Edge Sports head coach rankings, made an error in overtime that will give the ball back to the 49ers. And this is one, you know, we've talked the last couple of weeks when we get into our top five lists, especially the decisions. A lot of them are similar. We've covered them before. Pretty much every week these situations come up. This, I think, is a new one we haven't really covered yet. Um, 
Overtime, opening possession, six and a half minutes left. Cincinnati has fourth and seven on the San Francisco 23-yard line. And Armada liked the decision to go for it instead of kick the field goal. It was a four and a half percent error, which comes out to be, I think, number three, yeah, the, the number three worst error of the fourth down decision of the week. Why don't you talk through this one a little bit? Because, you know, we talked beforehand. I understand it. Obviously, I've been around the model, been here long enough that kind of I can think the same way as the model and have come around to a different way of thinking in the NFL. Even when I was watching this before I ran it live, I was like, a field goal is definitely going to be the right call here, but it's not. Yeah, this one is subtle, and it, it'll be a challenge to try to, I think, really speak to what's going on here. But, I mean, I think if I were to try to simplify it down to just a simple, you know, simple one-liner, two-liner, it's, it's just that – that opening drive, having that opening drive free roll, right, to start the start overtime mm-hmm. is very valuable. And when, you know, you are faced with a situation, fourth and seven, um, that is borderline, I guess I would call it borderline, right? Uh, you know, some coaches would say, oh, no, like we, we just kicked the field goal. Yeah. But if it, when it's borderline, you definitely, I think, want to maintain the free roll, right? So by <laughs> By taking, you know, by making a decision here that ends the drive, you and you know, just with three points, you you seed that free roll, right? Um, and you give your, you, you know, you basically allow your opponent back in the game. Um, you don't want to do that lightly. And uh, you know, fourth and seven is definitely on the longer side of a fourth down go, but the conversion rates are still high enough that uh, we think it, it's justified in, in, in going for it. Um, I think importantly as well. When you go for it and fail, you're really no worse off than you know this. What's gonna happen? I guess you are worse off, but you your opponent is is not like gifted some sort of uh, like uh, absolute like super valuable field position, mm-hmm. right? Um, it's it's basically the equivalent of like a touchback on an ensuing kickoff, and um, you know they still ha- they're still gonna go down the field and try to kick a field goal on you to to win the game. Um, so you're you're sort of in a similar situation as as you would be. Uh, even if you just take the field goal here, right? Take the points. But yeah, we um, we think this is about four and a half percent error. Four, yeah, four and a half percent error. And um, yeah, we just think that you know keeping the offense on the field here, um, trying to seal it and clinch it with with uh, your guys uh, on offense is really the right thing to do. Um, yeah, it, it like I said, I, I think it's subtle. There's like a, kind of a whole bunch of things that our model is able to account for here. That are just hard to hard to speak to, right? Like mm-hmm. between the conversion rates and then, uh, you know, how much value there is uh, towards shutting out your opponent from any possession because you have that free roll, uh, and then obviously there's sort of that equivalent, um, you know, drive that they're going to have whether or not you you go for it and fail or whether or not you convert the field goal. Um, it's just yeah, we just think it's the right thing to do. Yeah, and it's you made a good point there that there are some times that the model does things and works in ways and gives results that are really hard for us to to explain to put into words and I think that's that's not necessarily a, a negative like oh you don't know what the model is doing you don't know what what is actually happening you know how can how can you you know be an expert on this or whatever it may be but I think that just goes to speak to how good the computer models can be you know you may, there's so many assumptions that go into it. there's so much data and play by play that the model has been trained on that it has that is a very, very, very large set of data, but it can do so much that even, you know, we can't comprehend it. You know, sometimes it's a negative that, you know, oh, well, it doesn't know what the coach knows within the game of what's happening in this specific game, but it can just, it, it, it can process the game in ways that you can't really wrap your head around sometimes as a, a human. And that's kind of the point of the model and really of, of any of these models that are coming out um, really in the last, what's it been? 10, 15 years now. Yeah. I think one other thing, as I sort of, uh, you know, uh, was was, was pausing there to think, another thing that's, like, important to consider in overtime, right, is that your subsequent possession of the ball is is less valuable, right, and and not in in sort of in a dramatic way because the clock is running down Mm -hmm. and there's no more, you know, once the clock runs out, or I, I guess the way I'd put it is, sort of expecting or, or, or placing value on getting the ball back, like you have to pl- place a lot less on it because, you know, there's only so much time left in overtime, and when that clock runs out, there's no more possessions, right? It's not like the end of, you know, say the third quarter or something like that where you get the, you get the ball to start the next quarter. And um, so when you're the Bengals here, if you kick a field goal, there's like six and a half minutes left on the clock. There are situations in this game, well, obviously the Niners could just go down and win with a touchdown, but there are situations as well where – 
even if they're able to, to lead a drive and, and tie it up, you may get the ball back and there's just really, you know, you still, you still have enough time to do something, but mm-hmm. not enough time to really, um, uh, like, realize the full value of that possession, yeah. right? Um, and in this scenario, you know, we know San Francisco scored, but with two minutes left, if Cincinnati is able to come up with a stop there, they had already used one of their time, or they still had their timeouts, I believe. San Francisco used one timeout there. Mm-hmm. There's not a lot of time left. Said even if they get a field goal to tie it, you're really sh- pushing down the field to try and get a score there. After that, if you even have enough time left. Yeah, and, and so I think you know. And then another thing too with overtime is that oftentimes, um, you know, whenever you have a, a situation where you can sort of for, like force the win, you know, on your opponent, mm-hmm. you know, force a win on uh, over your opponent by you know not allowing them a chance to respond, that's always going to be weighted more heavily than, you know, a whole bunch of the outcomes that are end and tie, right? Yep. Which becomes, you know, a very real or, uh, you know, an important possibility on a lot of, you know, potential future potential outcomes uh, than, say, um, you know, when you're able to, to really force the issue on your opening drive and, and, and play for the touchdown. And, yeah, so, I, you know, that's why this one comes out as being a 4.5% error. Yeah. Um, we understand that that diverges, I think, from conventional wisdom and, and probably also some other folks uh, in the analytics community as well. But, yeah, we, I think, really, you know, our model definitely reveals to us that being staying aggressive um, is really the right thing to do, even in this sort of uh, situation in overtime. Yeah, and as we mentioned, they went down. Uh, San Francisco scored on a walk-off touchdown. Actually, it was not called a touchdown at first. It was reviewed and was a great play by Brandon Ayuk down the sideline to keep his feet in bounds, get the ball across before going out of bounds. So ended up coming back to, to hurt the Bengals. You know, they took that three-point lead, but San Francisco marched down the field. A huge play from George Kittle, outstretched his arms to make a catch on third and five uh, that set up the touchdown instead of having to settle for a field, or potentially settle for a field goal. Knowing that it was Kyle Shanahan, he probably would have gone for the field goal on a fourth and five there. Um, but, yeah, San Francisco able to come back with a win. So both teams – Gave up both uh, Tampa Bay and San Francisco, gave up big leads, but were able to hold on in overtime and come away with wins, so able to to escape. Definitely was not as easy as it looked like it was going to be through the first half of both of those games. Yeah, that's right. Um, clinging, clinging on for dear life, we'll say. And good, you know, I think props to both uh, the Bills and the Bengals for, you know, getting their act together late and, and making a close game, but... Unfortunately, their coaches uh, kind of, I think, let the teams down a little bit um, is the way I'd put it. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, being staying aggressive, being aggressive in, in important situations, I think really does give your, your team the best chance to win. And, uh, you know, it's it's sort of like easy to, to, to play Monday morning quarterback, but, um, you know, who knows with, with like the level of, of execution that they had, if they just had, I think, maybe more opportunity or they, you know, we, we didn't take the offense off the field in important spots. Like they might have not, we've said this before, might not have needed overtime at all. And they, they could have just sealed it in regulation. But, you know, what could have been? Who knows? Yep. Yeah, and you mentioned both coaches kind of had rough days. And that's something we talked about Sean McDermott. Both he and Zach Taylor were, were kind of getting roasted online throughout the game. You know, it's social media, but a lot of good points. You know, they had fourth and one from the 49ers 19 late in the four, first quarter, trailing by three chose to kick the field goal had a fourth and two from the 49ers 10 yard line later in the in the half uh, chose to kick the field goal those two together were about a five percent decrease in win probability and then coming out of halftime they had uh three straight runs i think it was fourth and one at their own 34 down by 11 i think it was 17 to 6 chose to punt there so just you know questionable call all around you know we, we say a lot of times these two one two two and a half three percenters aren't huge they do add up, they and add in up, any yeah. of these situations, if they can get the first down and get a touchdown, they win that game in regulation. So no guarantees, as we always say. You know, it's not guaranteed they convert. It's not guaranteed they don't. Even if they do convert, there's no guarantee they don't get stopped and have to kick a field goal anyway. But just situations that, when you look back throughout the game, are important. And at the time of the decision, you don't know what's going to happen. You just you if you've got a good chance to convert and to keep going for a touchdown, that's what you want to do. Touchdowns win games in the NFL more often than not. So. Unless you're Jacksonville against Buffalo, there were no <laughs> touchdowns in that game, and Jacksonville got the uh, the win. But yeah, anyway, now that we've got the the big storylines out of the way, covered those two really the most exciting games of the of the night, of the weekend. Aside from that Green Bay Chicago game you mentioned was exciting, crazy, kind of a crazy second quarter. But aside from that, really not a lot. So now we're going to get into our top five most impactful plays 
of the weekend action. These are the plays that had the most impact on the game in terms of win probability. So it's either positive or negative. We rank them in an absolute value manner. Um, and it's always from the offense's perspective again. So starting with number five, we had the Panthers and Falcons. This was second quarter, almost halfway through. Panthers had third and six on the Atlanta 36. And Cam Newton, this is going to be a big one anytime. A pick six, taking back 66 yards for a touchdown, costing the Panthers 24.7% win probability. And this was a game we actually had the Panthers pretty heavily favored compared to the market. I think we had them at 7% compared, or at seven points. Uh, favorites compared to it was two percent last time I checked last Thursday or Friday I don't it didn't have much movement throughout the week so I think it, it probably stayed the same um, over the weekends but just a, a big mistake from the Panthers here giving up a touchdown you always hate to do it you know third down you're in in position for a field goal instead you see yourself down seven yeah that's yeah you mentioned it I mean don't have a ton to add here other than Pick sixes are bad, yeah. <laughs> really bad. Uh, and, and, and For the any, offense, at least. Yeah, exactly. Anytime you throw one, you're, you're likely to end up in this top five. So, um, yeah, and, that, and especially, you know, in, in this game where both these teams are kind of fighting for their playoff lives, really, really uh, rough rough loss to take for the Panthers. And as you mentioned, we thought we thought they had a lot better chances in this one uh, than they I think they showed on the field uh, yesterday, unfortunately, for them. Yep, and so – Number four and number one both come from a game we didn't cover. I'm going to skip over number four for a minute. Number three was the – we talked about already the Tom Brady pass to Rashad Perriman to win the game. Number two was uh, Robbie Gold's missed field goal that lost the game at the end of regulation. That was a 40.1% decrease in, prob- win, in, in win probability. Now, number four, number one come from the Ravens-Browns game. Another game – this one was a near comeback, fell short at the end, but – Cleveland really struggled down the stretch of this one. I don't. I think they failed to score in the entire second half, if I have that correctly. Yeah, they were up 24 to six at halftime. Ended up only winning 24 to 22. Number four was the fourth and sixth at the Baltimore 45. It was uh, uh, Tyler Huntley was in the game at this point over Lamar Jackson. Came in pretty early. This is after uh, or late in the game. A minute left. They basically need you know, with Justin Tucker you know, maybe 10 yards to get a, a long field goal attempt uh, or a very long field goal attempt. That'll be put him at 63 yards, which we know he's capable of making. But they throw the ball short of the sticks. It's about two yards beyond the line of scrimmage. Rashad Bateman gets taken down right away, and Cleveland wins the game. So that's a 27.6% decrease in win probability. Really questionable play call there, I guess, throwing it that short um, of the sticks. I mean, I've, you know, sometimes you have those plays where they're kind of – You've got a guy rolling out in the flat where he's open. You can get it to him a yard or two, but he's got a ton of room. But this one just didn't really seem to make a ton of sense. Yeah, I mean, hate to yeah hate to lose by uh, you know I, I guess at, at the least what we can say is and it's pretty straightforward, right? They they had to be going for it unless uh, you know you, you wheel Justin Tucker out there to to kick an even larger a bomb, seventy two yard. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this uh, yeah as you mentioned, questionable. Questionable play call. Hard to know. Hard to say, really, um, without knowing all the other details of the play. And obviously, with Huntley in there, you have backup quarterback. So, um, you know, a whole bunch of things uh, could could have been playing into that one. You know, maybe the right play. They had the right play called, or the one that they wanted, but maybe just the execution of it was was not right. Um, so hard hard to to really know the full extent of uh, of the breakdown here. Um, you know, we. No less about the X's and O's, but certainly we, from what we saw, it looked like maybe they could have dialed something up a little bit better. Um, but yeah, well, I, at, what the, at the very least, what we can say is that based on the execution, was it was a big play to fail that fourth down right there. Especially, you know, as you mentioned, they just needed a, a little, you know, a little bit further down the field to to get Justin Tucker in range. Uh, that guy can kick bombs. And um, and actually, speaking of Justin Tucker, he was in, involved in in our uh, top execution play of the week. Yeah, it would have been really cool to see him attempt a 72-yarder. I think they said he's made them, you know, oh, in pregames, games taking an extra couple steps. Um, would have been really cool to see, at least. Um, but, yeah, Tyler Huntley now a couple really good games this year where he's led a comeback. They won the one against Chicago, this one they didn't win. But you mentioned number one with Justin Tucker was the onside kick that they recovered to get them in position here to, to try and win the game. It was only a minute 17 left. It was after they scored. Uh, got the I think they got the extra point on that one, yeah, because they um, got took the seven points. They were down nine because this was they went for two earlier, down nine, right, to try and get it to seven points. Um, did not get it, so they knew they needed a touchdown and a field goal. 
But recover the onside kick, which doesn't happen a lot. I know. I think we've seen a few in the last couple of weeks, though. Chicago even recovered yeah, one, last, one night. last night. That one really didn't matter as much. I think they were down what fifteen. Uh, that was right at the end of the game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this one took them from twelve percent up to fifty seven point nine percent, a forty five point eight percent increase. Most impactful play of the weekend. Really not surprising that it made them the favorites in this game, considering the field position and that it's Justin Tucker. You know, we always say we know who the kickers are in this model. And, you know, they're at their own 41, only needing about 15 yards to get in his range. Yeah, that was just an absolutely huge play for that reason. You know, super high leverage. You know, I think, uh, you know, in general, when we think about, like, how often these kicks are recovered, these onside kicks are recovered under the new rules, we think, yeah, it's probably, like, low single, you know, maybe high single digits, 10%, 10% maybe. something like that. But, um, yeah, if you've been paying attention this year, might kind of slowly be coming around to the fact that like these special teams coaches, these special teams units are getting a little bit sharper mm-hmm. on on, uh, on how they're executing these plays. Um, and, you know, we're we're, de- we're dealing with like not very much data, low sample size, but um, yeah, it's hard hard to uh, to to argue the other way because it's um, yeah, there's definitely definitely been I think some surprise recoveries and uh, yeah, this one was was I think a bit lucky as well. Kind of looked like the. Uh, you know, I, I don't know who it was on the special teams unit for the for the Browns, but it was almost like he was a bodyguard taking you know taking a bullet or something. Yeah, he went like to block that. instead yeah, of yeah. recovering the ball. It's just, almost like didn't see. He's like, I know I'm supposed to block here, but oh shit, there's the ball. Yeah, weird weird bounce and hit him kind of in the chest and ran, ran right to the Ravens. But yeah, it's uh yeah it was was super high leverage as we mentioned. Uh, just just being you know at the part of the field that they were, they had a, you know a little bit over a minute with which to work. So. Um, Definitely, especially if they had Lamar. Oh man, this would be even you know be even bigger because, you know, from that point it's almost a lock that they're able to get in reasonable field goal range, and then you have the best kicker of all time at your disposal to win the game. You know, I think you definitely like those chances. So what could have been for the Ravens? You know, unfortunately they weren't able to pull it out. Hopefully Lamar can get healthy, and uh, you know, best of, of luck to them the rest of the way. Yeah, and you mentioned special teams; they've been kind of getting a little better at those. It seems like without the running. You know, onside kicks have always been this way. Uh, you know, without the running startup, though, those high bouncing kicks, if you're able to execute those well, it seems like, you know, Dallas recovered the one last year that was just kind of like spinning on its side. Yeah. It seems a little bit more difficult. It seems like maybe it's better because if you can get that high bounce, you get your team, you know, enough time, you know, an extra second to get down the field. You know, it's only 10 yards you got to get really. So, yeah. So it seems like those, and that's kind of, it wasn't a huge bounce here, but still took a couple of those big bounces and they were able to get there fast enough to recover. So, Again, that onside kick was a 45.8% increase in win probability for the Ravens, the most impactful play of the Week 14 action, with one game to go. Now, moving on to our top five best fourth down decisions of the week. Before we do that, don't forget to rate, review, subscribe to all of the Edge Sports shows on the Edge Sports podcast platform, as well as our Edge Sports YouTube channel. So moving on to the top five best decisions, best fourth down decisions from the week in action, the plays that had the most pre-snap impact on win probability for the offensive team. So number five, again, number five is the Panthers again. We had them number five and impactful. This one is a little bit borderline, but I still think a lot of coaches w- would probably punt in this situation and, and really no big good decisions this week. A lot of them you know, turned into bigger errors. But and a lot of games we mentioned weren't close, so there's really not a chance to make those big calls, big errors, big good, big goes. But this one, Panthers were down 12, 12, 18 left in the fourth, had fourth and two at their own 33, choosing to go for it. You know, you're down two scores. It makes sense. Like I said, I could see a coach saying, "Hey, we still got 12 minutes. If we can get a stop, a touchdown, a stop, touchdown, you know, whatever it may be." But this one was the, was the right call, uh, regardless. A 2.6 percent increase in pre-snap win probability, and Carolina was able to convert here, not able to come back for the victory, um, but still good call. Yeah, I mean, this is the sort of thing that I think it feels to me like these are the sorts of decisions that coaches are regularly getting right now. Um, that just a few years ago, you know, I don't know if it's because we're getting different different guys in those seats now or um you know we've, we've sort of ditched a lot of the old school football mentality behind but just a few years ago I really feel like you would see so many teams punt the ball in this situation you know there's just too much time left on the clock as you alluded to mm-hmm. um but I think now now that uh you know coaches in general have gotten sharper and, and come around to the idea of going forward and going forward early um you know you, you start to see uh, things like this. And so, yeah, I mean, fourth and two from, from your own 33 with 12 minutes left, what are you doing? But if you're playing to win the game, it's the right thing to do. And, uh, um, you know, gives your team the best chance to win. You know, maybe you'll lose. There's more, probably, a, you know, a higher chance that, 
or you know there's a higher probability now that you'll lose the game by a lot um, and be embarrassed I guess um, but there's also a higher probability that you'll you know come back tie this game up or take the lead or, or win it right yep. which is should be what you're what you're playing for so and this in the BC you mentioned lose by a lot more this in the BCS style points right. don't count that's not around anymore not that it ever really counted in the NFL right um, but yeah completely agree yeah win, and wins really big here you know against a, an opponent who's battling for that same playoff spot you are so um, yeah pr- I think props to Matt rule and in, in going you know going for it here in the situation. Uh, like I said, I think just a few years ago, um, across the league, you would see, yeah, you'd see a lot of punts, I think. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just, that's just sort of my speculation, but I, you know, I, I, I do believe that, that that to be true. And, um, you know, I, I, credit to him, uh, Matt Rule, that is, for uh, giving his team the best chance to win. Yeah, and you mentioned fighting for a playoff spot. Atlanta, so probably, you know, they're 10th in the NFC. They've been sneaky. But, yeah, they're tied at 6-7 and seven with uh, Washington, Minnesota, and Philly, who are 7-8-9. Yeah. They lose the tiebreaker over Atlanta, or they, they lose it from Washington because of better percentage in conference games. Um, but they're there, they're only a game back. They're 4-4 four and four instead of 5-3. and three. So a lot can happen in these last four weeks when we've got, what, one, two, three, four, five teams at 6-7 and seven fighting for the seventh spot. San Francisco at 7-6 and six at number six. They're not necessarily safe either. So same goes for the AFC. I mean, you've got a lot of teams. The 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 spots are all 7-6. and six. You've got the Steelers a half a game back, the Raiders and the Dolphins each a game back, and then the Chargers and Ravens at four and five, only a game ahead. So, going to be really exciting, I think. I don't, you know, remember in years past. You know, it, it, it's hard to remember the different playoff scenarios from years past, but it seems like this is a lot closer than we've seen, really, in quite a while. Yeah, 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 for sure. There's, you know, I mentioned at the top, a lot of parity, pretty flat year. Um, there's nobody who's really, you know, a couple teams have really separated themselves, but nobody's like on, on an undefeated record or anything yep. like that, and. And then you sort of look at the teams vying for playoff spots. There's a lot of six and sevens and just, you know, kind of like black and blue uh, sort of, uh, you know, records, if you will. Um, just, you know, a lot of – makes it competitive, right? Yeah. right? It makes it interesting. I think more fans have, have uh, something at stake here, something that their team is playing for. So, yeah, it should make for, you know, an interesting final, you know, a uh, few weeks of the, of the regular season. Definitely makes it fun when it gets down to now week 16, 17, even 18, when you've got those scenarios where like six things have to break right for a team to make it, and they <laughs> yeah. make it, or one of them doesn't yeah. happen, unfortunately. But we do know there will be no 8-8 eight and eight team in the playoffs this year. I think yeah. that joke's probably been used quite a few times already, but it's still true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Moving on to number four best decision of the week, Ron Rivera, the guy who topped our list last week for the worst fourth down decisions. This game did not go well for Washington at all, but early on down 11 nothing. 41 seconds left in the first quarter, had fourth and two at the Dallas 46. Made the right decision, but things got a heck of a lot worse for Washington in a hurry. Chooses to go for it. Taylor Heineke is sacked, fumbles, recovered, and returned for a touchdown to put Dallas up 18 to nothing. Just, you know, they made it, uh, another team that made it a game late ended up getting a pick six to get within seven late in the game. We'll kind of get to the aftermath of that when we get to our worst decisions. But this one, you know, good call. You know, you're across midfield. Down 11, it's a fourth and two. It's kind of a no-brainer. We cover these kind of every week in that really your own 45 to the opposing 40 is pretty much always going to be a go on like a fourth and fourth and one, fourth and two, even fourth and three oftentimes if this was a fourth and two. Yeah, yeah, we like the decision. Definitely the you know a good call here. Um, you still have all of your timeouts, so you can really do a lot if you pick up a first down here. Um, you're already down 11, so going for it really makes a lot of sense. The part of the field that you're, you find yourself in uh, – there's just not a lot of good alternatives, but there are all these, you know, all, all these sort of checkpoints before. But um, yeah, that, the actual execution on the on the subsequent play, nightmare fuel. It's just, uh, yeah, not good. You know, strip sack, fumble, return touchdown. Yikes, um, to go down 18. But that be, all that being said, right play call, and, and yeah, as you mentioned, they were able to kind of Washington was able to get back in it uh, late and uh, turn this one into a competitive one, much more competitive than it was at this point. <clears throat> yep, and. Number three, well, we actually have a tie for number two. So one of them, just going to run through because it's pretty simple. Uh, Lions down seven in the second quarter, about five minutes or six minutes into the second quarter. Fourth and one, Detroit 50. Dan Campbell, again, chooses to go for it, has been very aggressive this season. We saw that last week. They failed to convert two fourth and ones. This week they get a fourth and one at the 50, and they do convert with nine yards. It's a 2.9% increase in pre-snap win probability. The Saints... Sean Payton, who we see on both lists this week, so we'll get to his worst. But for now, his best 
I think this was their first drive of the game. I believe the Jets got the ball first, so second drive of the game. Saints uh, tied at zero, fourth and one at the Jets, 26th. Fourth and one, I'm sorry, 10 minutes left in the first quarter. So very early to go is, is really a no-brainer here. Really right. not much to cover there as well. 2.9% just like that Lions decision. Number one is, I don't know if I would call this a no-brainer. Um, I mean, we saw it, we talked about it. Sean McDermott had almost the exact same scenario yeah. and did not go for it. It was Packers, Bears. Packers have fourth and goal at the two. 6.04 left in the second quarter. I mentioned earlier Sean McDermott, they had fourth and goal at the three. Again, or against a superior opponent, at least, uh, to the Bears is is Tampa Bay. But still, yeah. Matt LaFleur made the right decision, went for it. Uh, it was a 3.5% increase in win probability. Again, not you know our biggest one of the week at 3.5 is probably our smallest, best fourth down go of the season. Nonetheless, it was the right call. They were able to get the touchdown to get it to 10-7 to instead of 10-3. to Just kind of the start of a really crazy second quarter there in Green Bay. But the right call. I mean, there's really, I don't think, much more to add on this one. Yeah, it's just uh, too valuable uh, a play to, to surrender, you know, and, and kick a field goal. Um, especially, you know, if you're the Packers and you're already up big at this point, it costs you less. But, you know, they, are, they were such a heavy favorite in this game to surprisingly find themselves down 10 here early. Um, yeah, make the most of, of uh, every possession you have from here on out and, and, and you know, lock in the go. Um, and, of course, it paid off for, for the Packers. And you mentioned if it was late and they had a big lead, it would be closer. And they did have one with three minutes left in the third quarter, fourth and goal at the two again, chose to go for it. It was only a 0.7% error because Green Bay was already near pretty much 95% to win. So, yeah, yeah very. So it just goes to show – you know, the same situation, that's how important, pretty obvious, but how important the time and the score are. You know, Green Bay was only up eight eight points later in the game at that situation, but they were such a heavy pregame favorite that they're expected to win at that point anyway. So, yeah. really good call from LaFleur. Again, tops the list, only a 3.5% error, but hey, he takes the cake for the best decision, at least until tonight. I have a feeling one of Kingsbury, maybe not <laughs> McVay, more so Kingsbury than McVay, We'll make a really good call that'll top that, especially if it's a close game like we think it should be. Yeah. We will get to that Monday Night Football preview here in a minute. We're going to first go through our top five worst fourth down decisions of the week. Before doing that, just want to remind you about our site, our app, edgesports.com. Get pregame betting insights for every single NFL game. You can see our fair value spread, our fair value total. You can see how the public is betting on this game and look at and see which games have value based on the market lines and those market totals. So we'll get into our Monday Night Football preview. You can kind of see how we use those numbers, and then you can get on there with the app on either iOS or Android or edgesports.com to take advantage of all of that information for free. So now, Scott, the worst, the best decisions are out of the way. We'll get to the worst. We did cover a couple of these. We'll probably move through these pretty quickly. There are a couple that we'll probably need to explain. But first, we've got the Saints and Jets tied at three. Second quarter, eight minutes and 10 seconds left. Fourth and one at their own 34. It's a 3.3% a error to punt here. This is actually tied with number four, so tied for fourth. But you've got Taysom Hill, who ha can run the ball very well. Um, Alvin Kamara was back in this one. You're playing the Jets. You're the Saints. You know, might not be as good as they were, you know, before Jameis got hurt. You know, things have kind of gone downhill for them. But you even on your own 34, there's a lot of time left in this game. you got to take a chance and go for it there. Yeah. The, the offense – Saints have pretty good defense, and the Jets weren't really able to move the ball much. I don't think they scored a touchdown until like late in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I, I'm sort of left wondering. I, you know, maybe maybe Drew Brees was calling was calling fourth down plays. Uh, <laughs> you know, mo moonlighting as the as offensive coordinator or, or sort of the the fourth down play caller while while playing quarterback uh, in New Orleans. Um, now that he's no longer there, it really seems like uh, Sean Payton has. Turned a page, but gone backwards actually, um, because yeah, I, you know he just used to be you know at the top of mind for being one of the more aggressive coaches in the league. He's obviously had a long tenure in New Orleans, and uh, you know I think I just seem to recall so many situations where he would be really you know pedal to the floor, going for it in in all sorts of spots uh, in years past. But now it seems like he's really gone passive and conservative, and in here on this fourth and one, you know I know it's. It's sort of in your own territory. I know it's early, and you know you're not playing, you know the the best opponent in the New York Jets. But yeah, it just sort of seems like a different mindset. You really, you really ought to be maximizing all your possessions. Um, with Taysom Hill back there, you would think, right? You would think that uh, he's sort of tailor made for for picking up one yard. Um, yeah, maybe Taysom made. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's just really a head scratcher. Um, you know, I, I think this is this this feels more kind of like a, like an old old school football kind of uh, way of thinking, punting it here. But um, yeah, we uh, you know I think the analytics says go, and it, it seems pretty clear to me why. I mean, you're just you're gonna you're gonna convert fourth and ones at such a high rate. That's really all you need to know. Um, ignore the other situational stuff because it's not that important here. Um, yeah, keep the offense out there and go for it. Yeah, and to your point, Sean Payton is ninth in our coach rankings this year, only 12th in CCI. He's typically in your top fives. I mean, just a couple years ago, he was 10th in CCI. They was number five overall last year. I think he was also top five. Um, so really surprising to see him, like you said, not doing as well as, as he has in the past. I mean, it's just – it's. This it's is a shocking. guy. And actually, I forgot about this. Last year, he actually finished dead last in CCI. Uh, was 17th overall. They were number two in EPI, but he was dead last oh in CCI goodness. last year. So he's okay. gotten better than last year, but still, last year I think was a bit of an anomaly for yeah. for whatever reason. But yeah, this year still not doing well. I'm actually surprised at that okay. from last year. I forgot about that. Yeah, I forgot about that as well. So maybe so it's... we see him. We've seen him kick a couple fourth and short field goals down late in the game where he should yeah. have gone for a touchdown. Like not to take away from the fact that he's just not been aggressive this year as as much as normal yeah so i guess it started last year i don't know i just in my in my mind i have I, you know i remember the guy who who opted for the surprise onside kick yeah. in that super bowl against the colts i mean breeze was hurt last year so maybe it's something when he doesn't have drew breeze he just and even you know when he was playing he was That's injured right. that maybe he just isn't as confident uh now who knows yeah. maybe kind of we've seen the same from bill belichick who yeah. used to be more of an aggressive guy and Maybe it's just an old age thing, you know. Sean Payton's not too old, but he, he's been around a while. Maybe he's just more into, into trusting his defense, if you will. Yeah. But now, moving on, number three. This is the one we already covered. Bengals, that overtime field goal. Fourth and seven at San Francisco 23. Choosing to kick the field goal in the opening possession was a four and a half percent error. Again, not a huge error, that fourth and seven. You know, if this was a fourth and one or fourth and two, not only would this be a much bigger error, I actually think Zach Taylor would have gone for it because um, he has shown some aggressiveness uh, throughout the season. This one, you know, wasn't really wasn't really that way, but I would not be surprised if that was a lot closer. Fourth and seven, we do still think that the go is the better decision there. Number two, we covered as well. Shanahan fourth and two at his own 37 late in the fourth quarter. Time winding down, you know, but still enough time for the Bengals, even if you do punt that ball away, which they did, and the Bengals did score. And then number one, the Saints. Again, Sean Payton, number one and number five, bookending the top five. Up four, third quarter, a minute left, coming down to the end of the game. Really, neither team was playing really well. But fourth and two at the Jets' eight. Chooses to take a delay of game instead of going for it. And fourth and two. Yeah, I, 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 I'm I, amused by, uh, you know, these delay of games, like the, the fake out, you know, they're going to fake the hard count or whatever to, to try to draw the other team off sides, get a free first down, but... Yeah, just leave the offense on the field and go for it. I mean, um, yeah, I don't know. It, I don't know how, how often those sort of fake outs really work. It doesn't seem very likely. It, it kind of what it what it strikes me as is uh, just sort of overthinking it or, or or thinking too hard about the wrong things, right? Yep. Like icing the kicker or or you know taking these fake out delay of game penalties or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't have a strong opinion about those things, but I do have a strong opinion about not going for it here. This just seems silly. I mean, you're on the Jets' eight. Uh, you know, I know that you're favored in this one, but, um, yeah, I, I, you're going to convert fourth and two just way too way too often, even when you fail. Jets, you know, an already bad offense are in a tough spot against a good New Orleans defense are, are just, like, really backs up against the wall. So It's a prime pick six opportunity. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Um, so, yeah, this is just – our worst error of the week at a little over 10%. Um, yeah, really just do not like this one. And, you know, obviously the Saints are were heavy, not heavy favorites, but, you know, solid favorites against the New York Jets here. But, uh, yeah, they're only up 10-6. So, I mean, you really, you know, kicking a field goal here still keeps it a one-possession game. I think, uh, you know, that's just further further uh, support for, for going for it here. And, uh, yeah, unfortunately for Sean Payton, does not find the right call in our eyes. And, um, you know, really, really think he, he could have done better here. But, um, you know, the Saints were able to hold on and, and pull it out. And sometimes I wonder, you know, you hear coaches say a lot of times it's the – they say it, they're coaches that aren't very good because they'll say, you know, we didn't go for it because I didn't have a fourth down play that I liked there. Like, you don't really hear the Andy Reeds or, or guys like that, the Brandon Staley's really saying that much. 
But sometimes I wonder if, you know, early in the game, you know, this really isn't early. It's still third quarter, a lot of time left. But I wonder, you know, I would think they would have a few plays, but maybe they don't want to use their good plays in case they need it on a fourth down later in the game. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not a football coach. Um, these guys are paid for it. And, you know, some the ones that say that, I feel like it's like you can't come up with a fourth down play when you really need to do it, like because you – you know, it's not on your list, whatever it may be. Yeah. Um, so sometimes, you know, early in the games, I wonder if that's a thing where they just don't want to give away their their really good plays, but it, it still doesn't make sense. Maybe, yeah. I, you run a quarterback sneak. You know, you don't even need to use a creative play on a fourth and one, even a fourth and two with Taysom Hill. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, Sean Payton, Andy Reid, those guys strike me as they're, they're probably like at the dinner table coming up with plays. You know, right. like they're just they're they're probably just spouting off plays in their sleep for all we know. Seems um, like your Tomlins and your Joe Judges and Fangio or something. <laughs> the guys are like, oh, we just didn't have a play. Yeah, we just didn't have a play. But yeah, I, I would I would doubt that that's the case for Sean Payton or like Andy Reid. But you know, who knows? Um, regardless, though, we just really don't like this call. And and uh, yeah, would like to see you know the old old Sean Payton yep. come back uh, and and the one who's who's really being aggressive and, and giving his team. Uh, the best chance to win every week. Um, uh, unfortunately, it was not the case here, but they, they still held on. Yep. Got the win, are still in the hunt for the playoffs, so it's not over yet for for those, those Saints down in New Orleans. Now, that'll do it for our top fives. Just want to remind you that you can find all these both on our Edge Sports website, edjsports.com, and on the Edge Sports app. Uh, again, that's available for both iOS and Android. So moving on to our Monday night football game, an NFC West showdown, a rematch from earlier this year between the Rams and the Cardinals. So the Rams, excuse me, the Rams had a get right game last week against the Jaguars. They'd lost two in a row to the Titans and Green Bay, I think with their bye sandwiched between those two games. Cardinals also rebounded. They got Kyler Murray back, handled the, sorry, but handled the Bears pretty easily last week. Um, Kyler Murray hardly had to throw the ball, but in this one, you know, coach rank in our coach rankings, Cliff Kingsbury comes in third. Sean McVay comes in seventeenth. So something that you know we've talked about. And it's funny because Katie George and we're doing the coach rankings uh, videos that we do. We we're talking. She kind of had said something that we realized a couple years ago that when you get into these coach rankings and you're around them, you see them and you see these decisions, you realize that guys like Sean McVay who are thought of, you know, who are innovative, you know, great offensive minds, and are people kind of at least in the first couple years made him out to be this very aggressive coach really isn't you know he right. comes in 17th overall I said but only 26th in CCI whereas Cliff Kingsbury is third overall and eighth in CCI and last year uh, if not for two really big errors you know you can't discredit those um, but if not for those two big errors he had that were you know 20 plus percent 20.1 and like 19.9 he would have been in the top 10 in CCI again so Kingsbury would expect to have the better game this is really this game is giving me you know, we'll get to it, the lines um, and the total you'll talk about here in a minute, but it's kind of giving me vibes of that uh, Kansas City, uh, Los Angeles Rams game a few years ago on Monday night where they put up, what, like 109 combined points, a bunch of turnovers, a bunch of touchdowns. So how's this one looking, at least compared to the market in our eyes, Scott? Yeah, for sure. So market has the line that this one as uh, Arizona minus two. We actually think Arizona is um, – the sharper play here, and, and we think they're a stronger favorite than the market does, surprisingly. Um, we have them at minus four. So, you know, on the other side of the minus three, you know, that's definitely a solid favorite in our eyes. And, uh, yeah, we, we so we like playing we like playing the Cardinals in this one. And, uh, you know, they obviously are lining up against a very competent, really good, you know, good team, the Los Angeles Rams. Um, but, yeah, we just think that on both sides of the ball here that uh, Arizona is, is the stronger opponent. I think – you know, that kind of transitions transitions us to talking about the total. And you alluded to uh, the Chiefs-Rams uh, game from, I think, two two or three seasons ago on, on a Monday night that just delivered in all yep. sorts of ways. Uh, lots of lots of points. Tons but, of fantasy goods there. Yeah, for sure. Um, so the market line in this one is 51.5. And, a half, and uh, you know, we think the fair total is actually closer to 47. So we like playing the under in this one. And I think really that's just a credit to uh, both the, the defenses in this yep. one. So... That, and I think that is a big um, you know, counterpoint or, or difference between this matchup and, and that, that old uh, Chiefs-Rams game from a couple years ago. The defenses are just so much better uh, for these teams. Um, you know, Arizona is near the top. Rams have been good for a long time now, uh, with especially that front and, and, and those corners. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we just – yeah, we, we think that it's probably even, even a, a lower scoring affair than the market does, and we would play the under in this one. Um, and so kind of shifting over now and taking a look at the, uh, the public money 
it's pretty even, pretty even for the most part. Uh, the number of bets is pretty close to 50-50. Uh, the money is, sl you know, a slight edge on the Rams, so the, the amount of money being bet, uh, slightly, slightly larger for the Los Angeles Rams at a clip of about 60 to 40. So really, you know, I would, I would rule this as being kind of inconclusive, not really a strong signal either way as, uh, as to sort of the, the public money, the retail flow versus uh, the sharps and, and sort of uh, the difference there and, and what sides they're backing. So yeah, I mean, um, you know, our model likes playing the under as a, as you know, in summary, our model likes playing the under and likes uh, the uh, the Cardinals in this one will be an interesting one. I think, uh, you know, this this is definitely a matchup between two very strong teams. Uh, you know, in prime time should be a fun one to watch. Uh, I think I'll be tuning in and, and yeah, I can't wait to see where this one goes. I hope we're treated yep. to a game uh, like we were a couple seasons ago. You know, you know, put the put the defense away for a night, guys, and and let's uh, let's you know let's put up some points. It'll be it'll be it could be fun. Yeah, don't want to let down. You know, if it's going to be either like you said, no defense, just let's get a lot of scoring, or let it be a close game with some defense where it comes down to some big decisions late. You mentioned those two defenses. Uh, looking at they're both top six. The Rams are sixth in overall defense coming into the game. Arizona is third in overall defense. Now the Rams are the number five offense. Arizona only twelfth. Part of that though is because of the games with Colt McCoy. Right. Um, but Aaron Schatz, you know, our partner over at Football Outsiders, put out a tweet last week saying, you know, you can probably imagine it's true that the Cardinals are better on offense with Kyler Murray, but the difference isn't as great. It's only a difference of about 12% in DVOA. They're seventh with Murray, 19th with McCoy. You know, might seem like a big difference, but it's really, you know, that's not a huge difference there. It comes out to 12th overall in offense. So, Again, seventh with Murray, so looking at just Murray, still we're looking at two top ten offenses, two top seven offenses, two top six defenses. Should be in for a really good one. So hoping uh, hoping for a good one. You know, we had the, I don't remember if it was Sunday night or Monday night, when the Titans jumped out to just a huge lead over the Rams and what we thought was going to be a close game, even a, a Rams win, was not to be. But looking forward to that one. It, a lot of times it seems like we get some Monday night games that aren't the best, but we've saved uh, hopefully the best for last this week. So Good job to the NFL, uh, at least getting this this big matchup scheduled. So hopefully uh, the teams will deliver. So thank you all for listening to our Week 14 recap. Again, just some quick reminders about our shows on Mondays and Thursdays. You can find us here recapping every Monday. Uh, we will be here throughout the holidays as well, every Monday morning, recapping the, the week's action and the, the best and worst decisions from the weekend. And then on Thursdays, you can find me with the Edge Sports betting preview, previewing Thursday night football. I think there's actually only a couple Thursday night football games left, but then we'll have those Saturday games uh, that start coming in the last couple weeks of the season, as well as the Sunday action. You can find all of these on the Edge Sports Podcast Network, on any podcast platform that you prefer, or on our Edge Sports YouTube channel. Please give us a review, five stars. If you leave a comment, we'll read it on the next show. Uh, they haven't given us any reviews, so I'm not sure we've gotten any. They may have skipped over a couple of them, um, but we will read those, and, and you know, we'd love to see them. Read, write anything you want. doesn't even have to do with the show. Tell us some jokes. Again, a uh, reminder about our new site and experience uh, in our app, uh, Edge Sports, available for both iOS and Android. The website is edgesports, edjsports.com. Be on the lookout there and on our social media for our updated coach rankings video coming out on Wednesday. And then the very last order of business is that Football Outsiders, I mentioned Aaron Schatz and Football Outsiders are one of our partners. They're currently running a special for FO Plus, which is their premium subscription for just 99 cents a week for annual subscriptions. Got a lot of very good uh, daily fantasy or weekly fantasy, season long fantasy rankings. Scott Spratt has some really good uh, start sick column over there. Um, even betting, uh, betting pieces as well or betting information, they've got their FO picks. Uh, that you can see as well, all available with that subscription. 99 cents a week for the annual subscription. Check it out over at footballoutsiders.com slash subscribe. Scott, thank you for joining me. Everyone out there listening, thank you for listening and have a great week. Thanks, Ian.